What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. This is a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this, but no one. Whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. Genesis tells the story of man's beginning. And then in chapter 6, verse 4, it takes a very strange detour. It tells us that there were giants on the earth in those days when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. Is this myth or fact? Was there a time when giants walked the face of the earth? And can archaeology help us solve this mystery? Really big people have always been around. The Guinness Book of World Records has documented hundreds of men and women who have reached heights of eight feet or taller. The Bible's most famous giant is a powerful big guy that goes by the name of Goliath. Goliath, the brutish monster of inhuman strength. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. David hurls a stone from a sling Goliath gets cracked in the noggin, and then, before you know it, David's cutting off Goliath's head. Was there really a Goliath? If there was, the biblical city of Gat is the place to look. So I'm here in Gat, the Philistine warrior's hometown, to meet with archaeologist Aaron Mayer. I'm wondering whether he's found any giant-sized bones here. We're, we're standing right where the battle would have taken place in any event between David and Goliath. Well, and overlooking the area. The battle would have taken place right behind that hill. Where it, was everybody really short? Well, they, first of all, everybody was really short. Like, I'm 6'3", I'm, I'm so... If you take into account what the, uh, the, the average height of, uh, of a person during the Iron Age would be, he would probably be about a meter 60. Who, who would be that? The average the person? The average person. Right. Now, according to the biblical text, Goliath is three meters, three meters and something. Three meters. Uh, yeah, which is which is large, and even on uh, you know NBA scale, that's about nine feet. Nine feet tall. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Boy, you just feed him the just uh -huh, feed him uh -huh. the ball, and he dunks it, eh? Yeah, but you can always knock him in the balls. <laughs> the Bible isn't the only record of Goliath's story. The Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in a desert cave in 1947, also tell the story of Goliath except that Goliath's height is described in the scrolls as two full cubits shorter than the Bible's six cubits and a span. When you look at the, uh, the text of Samuel in, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so there he's depicted as, uh, as four cubits, if I'm not mistaken, so he's much closer to a, a normal size. Four cubits would make him how tall? About two meters, two meters or something. Also about six. Seven or something? Yeah, something of the sort. You know, that would be, you know, that would be tall even on today's standards, but still not, well, not, not it'd, unbelievably. It'd now, be a guard, not yeah. a center. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls contain the oldest versions of the biblical text, most scholars believe that scribal error is the cause of the two different heights. Scholars tend to trust the measurements listed in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But either way, Mayer never did find any large bones. And without them, we'll never be able to know for sure how big Goliath really was. Without Goliath, I'm starting to wonder what the Bible means by giants in the Holy Land. In any event, I've stumbled across another really big guy in the Bible, a giant who's even bigger than Goliath and who ruled his own biblical kingdom. He's a total man. He's a total man. My search for giants in the Holy Land is becoming a bit more difficult than I thought it would be. Goliath was a big no-show. So I'm going back into the book of Deuteronomy. It's here that we learn the story of the Bible's other giant, a rather tall king named Og, 
who fought and lost against the Israelites in the battle for the Holy Land. The Bible tells us that Og is the last remnant of a clan of giants known as the Rephaim, and that he had a giant bed, 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. A, a street in Jerusalem called Emek Rephaim, the Valley of the Giants. And we know from the Bible that Og, the king of the Bashan, was a giant. He was one of these Rephaim. Are you one of the giants? I would say. You really? Yeah. Right. What's your gut feeling on the giants? My gut feeling on the giants is I don't know. I know a lot more about the Dodgers. <laughs> the fact that the Bible tells us he had this giant iron bed, maybe that just means he had a, what we call today a Napoleon complex. Either that he had a very big girlfriend. You know that I'm the naked archaeologist, yes. right? We gotta get naked. It is hot. <laughs> it is hot. Okay, the Bible tells us that Og is one of these Rephaim. Yes. And he has this giant what? Uh, I don't A know. Giant. So archaeologically, instead of looking for one giant guy, we should be looking for? Several large boned women. <laughs> What I want to tell you is that Og was a giant. And if we're going to find evidence of giants roaming the earth, we should go to the biblical Bashan, which is today the Golan Heights. The further north I get into the Golan Heights, things seem to get bigger. Take these dolmens, for instance. Mysterious megalithic markers made from rocks that weigh over 40 tons. These dolmens can be found all over the Golan Heights. And even though they're not exactly proof that giants once roamed this land, they do make you wonder who could have put them here. Whoever it was also built something much more impressive, a 5,000-year-old megalithic site known as Rujem El Hiri. Not only is it considered the Middle East version of Stonehenge, it also contains a tomb that some people say is the final resting place of King Og himself. This is the mound itself. This is the outermost wall. So I'm meeting with Professor Yoni Mizrahi, the man who first excavated Rujam El Hiri back in the 80s. We entered into the tomb and we sat there for two weeks and sifting every uh, piece of dirt that, that we could. But it became clear very early that somebody was there before us because it seemed to be uh, looted. There were, you know, stones in there. It wasn't like clean and, and waiting for us. So, but looted in ancient times. Looted in ancient times. And apparently the looters on their way out dropped stuff. We found uh, three beautiful gold earrings. Uh, we found carnelian beads. We found uh, arrowheads, three or five arrowheads, and ceramics. All the stuff was dated to the late Bronze Age. I heard that some people speculated that since we're in the Bashan area, we know a name has come down to us of a famous Bashan king, Og, we know that he was huge. Doesn't it make sense that this would be the burial site of this giant? He would be in this megalithic structure. This person had to be very important. And you take mega sites and you take mega people and you put them together, it sounds great. But you haven't found anything which, says, which would indicate who was buried here? No. Did you find bones? No, no. Did you find a, you know, a sarcophagus or some sort? No. So somebody took it out? Somebody took it out, uh, and as I said before, it was looted. I wish the giant were alive, alive this very minute. Look inside his grave and see how lovely he looks in it. Inside the central mound is the tomb where Mizrahi found jewelry, indicating that at one point in time, it held a sizable treasure, which was looted thousands of years ago. The treasure of an empire, and it's mine! And then we moved some of the stones and we got this beautiful opening. entrance opening and then you can get inside <laughs> okay. after you. <laughs> so many snakes here, I want somebody to test it first. It's a tight squeeze getting into the tomb, but then it opens into a large hollow, leading me to believe that whoever was buried here might have needed a little extra legroom. 
somebody very, 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 very important was buried here. This was no ordinary burial place. Whoever it was, he was important. He rested here for a thousand years. He was surrounded by gold. And all that's left now is there's no proof. But there is, there is this space, and it's a very special place. So we may be, we don't know, we'll never know maybe, standing on Og's burial mound. Yeah, we'll never know. We'll never know. Even though the archaeology I'm finding is fascinating, it still isn't telling me who the biblical giants really were. Finding the bones of a giant human is starting to seem more and more unlikely, especially since there has never been a skeleton uncovered anywhere in the Middle East that has reached a height of more than six foot four. Has there been a mistake? So I'm going to take another look at the Genesis Giants reference, this time in Hebrew, to see what the passage says in the original. And to my surprise, the word giant doesn't actually appear anywhere in the book of Genesis. Another word is used, and that word doesn't mean giant at all. My search for giants in the Holy Land was a bust, so I decided to go back to the original Hebrew Bible and look at the reference again. I was taken by surprise when I learned that the word giant doesn't appear anywhere in the book of Genesis. The word used is Nephilim. According to Jewish and Christian folklore, the Nephilim were supposed to be the giant offspring of fallen angels having sex with human women. But in Hebrew, Nephilim doesn't even mean big, let alone giant. Translated into English, Nephilim actually means the fallen ones. I suddenly realized how it all got mixed up. You see, when the Greeks translated the Bible, they were influenced by their own myths about a giant race of titans. Instead of staying true to the original Nephilim, and by the time the King James Version was written in the 1600s, the word Nephilim had been totally replaced by giants. So, it turns out, I'm not looking for giants at all. I'm looking for the Nephilim. But who were these Nephilim? I think Professor Jerry Schroeder should be able to help me decode this biblical mystery. Genesis is his thing. You know, you read Genesis and there's Nephilim, there's fallen ones. Who are these guys? When they fall, Nephil is a Hebrew word which means fallen or lower down or, or sub, you know, less than perfect. And the Bible says there existed at the time of Adam beings that were completely human in shape and in intelligence, but they weren't humans. They lacked the neshama, the soul, the soul of humanity. Before the neshama, if you didn't look before like the soul. before the soul of humanity, if you didn't look like me, smell like me, and talk like me, I had you for dinner, literally. It was a doggy, it was a wild world. Kind of humans with souls and humans without. Humans with souls and hominids without. I keep going back there. Human looking beings, but without the neshama, without the soul of, hum of human life. What Professor Schroeder just told me is really wild. Because if chapter six of Genesis is really recording early human history, then the Nephilim that are mentioned in chapter six are really referring to another life form that coexisted with early humans. But what kind of other life form? I had to look at the passage in Genesis one more time just to be sure. With a proper translation, the passage reads, there were Nephilim in those days when the sons of God came unto the daughters of man and bore children by them. From the passage, it's starting to become clear that whoever these Nephilim were, they were some kind of hybrid offspring, the children of both the sons of God and the daughters of man. But then, who were these sons of God? From the fossil record, we know of only one other hominid to ever coexist with Homo sapiens, Neanderthal man. Could it be? that the Nephilim were actually the result of humans and Neanderthals having sex. My 
search for giants in the Holy Land is taking a series of very unusual turns, especially now that I've figured out that there had been a mistranslation. I'm not looking for giants anymore. I'm looking for the Nephilim. But as crazy as it might sound, the Nephilim were turning out to be some kind of hybrid offspring, a mixture of both humans and some other kind of hominid. From the archaeology, we know that only one other hominid ever coexisted with humans, Neanderthal man. So if I'm going to find any skeletons belonging to the biblical Nephilim, then my best bet is to look for places where Neanderthals and humans might have once lived together. Yes. And it turns out that one of the best places for this kind of thing is in northern Israel. The Neanderthals have disappeared except in Israeli traffic. There you can see the last of the Neanderthals. They're still amongst us. You see, according to theories of human migration, the Neanderthals came out of Europe, and Homo sapiens, early humans, came north out of Africa. Then, around 60,000 years ago, they both met up at the Carmel mountain range. And I've heard that in one of the caves there, there's proof that the two groups might have spent more than a few cold nights together. Could they have left any archaeological traces? To answer the question, I met up with Baruch Arensberg, one of the archaeologists who first excavated the cave. This is professor is going to take us to one of the most important finds in, in the world, I think. Right? In it is. The, isn't it? In the prehistory of the world, not in other... But in ideas. prehistory, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. You're going to lead us to the, uh, to the cave? Please, let's go. Let's go. I brought boots. On the walk up to the cave, the professor tells me that it's now completely covered in bat dung, which I'm not looking forward to. What can I say? Indiana Jones has a problem with snakes. The naked archaeologist has a problem with bats. Listen to them. Oh my god, I hate this, I have to say. I am not a fan of bats. Where's my stuff? There's naked archaeology, and there's all-dressed archaeology. When you go into a bat cave, I prefer all-dressed archaeology. A quick change into my bat-proof suit, and I'm good to go. Ugh, it smells here. Bat. Oh, so it's beautiful or not? Actually, there's some bizarre beauty to this. I didn't expect it, but it's beautiful. It's really amazing. 60,000 years ago, people were standing here. Yeah. Cavemen. Yeah. Professor Arensberg is showing me the dig area where they uncovered skeletons from both humans and Neanderthals at the same layer of stratigraphy. That's how he knows that they lived at the same time period in the same cave. And you can see the big differences between the layers of each period. It is like pages of a book. You can see how old are each page according to the stratigraphy. The archaeology, does it tell you one way or another whether they were communicating, cooperating? Were they very into their own species? They had the same culture because they were doing the same things. They were living in the same way. They were eating the same things. And they were burying the people in the same way. So these people were communicating. Uh, ma mating is a form of communication. Did they mate? Yeah, we cannot know that. Did they date? We cannot know if they were mating or not. Maybe they just had guilt-free sex, but uh, they just shit on my face. Don't worry about the shit. Uh, okay. I mean, don't worry about the shit. The bats are obviously trying to tell me something. So it's time to go. Besides, I want to see the professor's lab and take a close look at one of the skeletons he found in the cave. The professor tells me that he doesn't think it's fully human or fully Neanderthal. It's something in the middle, which sounds a lot like a hybrid to me. Is it possible that these are the bones of one of the biblical Nephilim? This is the cast of the entire skeleton as it was found. 
There are people that call him Neanderthal. There are others that call him um, Homo sapiens. And there are others that call him of unknown relation. What do you believe? <laughs> I believe that he is not a Neanderthal in the sensus stricto of the word. In the strict well, sense? Yeah. But what are you suggesting, that Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens were interbreeding? Most probably. Homo sapiens and Neanderthals were uh, very happy in the Holy Land. Really? <laughs> they, yeah, because they, they were living here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Together? We have some of them together. If these bones are in fact the remains of some kind of hybrid hominid, then they may be the solution to a biblical mystery. I began my quest with a search for the bones of biblical giants. Instead, I may have found the bones of the biblical Nephilim. The Neanderthals and Homo sapiens might have been happy for a while, but within 30,000 years of their historic meeting at Mount Carmel, their relationship fell apart. The Homo sapiens went on to populate the planet. The Neanderthals became extinct. Now, in the Bible, it mentions a race of giants. But now we know that that's really a mistranslation. There's no race of giants. It's a race of Nephilim. That's the term in the book of Genesis. And Nephilim means fallen ones. And if the Nephilim were the fallen ones, then why did they fall? Maybe these hybrid descendants of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals tried their best, but just didn't have the social skills, hygiene, divine spark, or soul necessary for moving forward, populating the world, and creating a truly human civilization.